I am Terry Jowers, uh, the lead organizer for Organizing for Health, and I'm from very rural Barmel County, South Carolina, and I've grown up in a family of activists. During the Depression, my grandparents regularly brought home hobos and struggled to feed them along with their 10 children because they couldn't stand the thought of anybody going hungry. Each year, my father, Quimby, plants an enormous garden so he can help feed all the widow women in town. As my son, William, would say, I was raised to be an activist. I've worked in political campaigns for nonprofit agencies and as a victim advocate. In the 1990s, I helped organize a, a movement which led to a victim's rights uh, amendment to the South Carolina uh, Constitution and it gave victims the right to have information and to get services they needed. Now it seems like all my years of activist activism have led me to public health. At 82 years old my father is still a very handsome man and he's often mistaken for Andy Griffith. But three years ago, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. We don't live in a community that has a primary care center. So once a year, my family travels 100 miles to see a neurologist who simply writes a prescription for Aricep and makes an appointment for the next year. No guidance and no help with the anxiety and the depression that is debilitating my father. We can do better than this. Every community should have a cost-efficient medical home where patients not only receive great care, but the help and support they need to live a healthy life. Physicians should have elect access to electronic records on all patients. So my father isn't prescribed two Benadryl and a glass of wine by one physician and a Xanax at bedtime by another. In South Carolina, we have many visionary, innovative projects and initiatives going on. But we also have a system that is financially unsustainable with dwindling access. And we have public officials who don't seem to understand the cost of, of, of cutting health care. But I know the power of working with people, and I, I know that with a shared purpose, we can work together to change this. I'm energized by being a part of Organizing for Health and working with this wonderful leadership team. We all share in the problem, and we all can share in the change. By organizing communities, both medical and public, we can increase access to care, reduce cost, and improve the quality of life for everyone in South Carolina. In a moment, we're going to let you share what calls you to leadership and health. But first, we're going to talk about um, the, the orga organizing strategy. One of the strategies that we use in organizing is public narrative, telling a story. And public narrative is used to motivate others to join you in action. It's a leadership skill that translates our values into action. The psychologist Jerome Berner wrote that we interpret the world in two ways, the analytical and the narrative. The idea is that we engage our strategy, the how, and we use our hearts to tell a narrative, the why, in leading us to use our hands in action. Let's take an example. I shared with you about organizing to get a, an amendment passed to the South Carolina Constitution uh, to include a Victim's Bill of Rights. But how did we do it? What was the strategy? 
We had solicitors doing press conferences. We organized victims and survivors and victim advocates and communities. We wrote letters. We rallied at the State House until we got um, a resolution on the 1996 ballot. That's the how. But what's the why? What motivated me to do that, to get involved? That would be Jennifer. Jennifer was beaten and raped and left in the woods badly injured by a man who drove a white Buick. And every time Jennifer saw a white Buick, she had an anxiety attack ended up, and ended up in an emergency room. She couldn't afford the treatment that she needed to get past this post-traumatic stress. So I organize for Jennifer and for all the victims of crime who deserve to have treatment. That is my motivation. In narrative, we use our heads and our hearts to motivate us to join to motivate others to join us in intentional action. So um, Values inspire us on, a, on a several different ways, but part of it is uh, physiological, part is cognitive, and part is behavioral. So what happens when you watch someone run a 50-yard 50, uh, 50 touchdown um, and score the winning, the winning touchdown for the game? You get excited, your heart races, uh, you feel anxiety, you feel joy, you jump in, up and down, you scream, and you might curse if it was uh, someone on the other team. It's what Kate calls the spine tingling effect. When you hear something that elicits a physiological reaction from you, something that you feel deep inside. So when I shared my story about my father having Alzheimer's, perhaps you thought about somebody that you knew who had Alzheimer's. When I shared that the neurologist just wrote a prescription, you might have felt anger or pity. But why did you feel something? Because emotions are the way we experience our values. Emotions are the way we experience our values. Many of you are healers and you care for others. You have no doubt experienced that as a feeling and it's motivated you to deeper action. So in Kate's story, um, if she had just told you that she was lying in a bed of pain and she couldn't move and she couldn't do anything and she was paralyzed and she left it there, would it motivate you to action? Probably not. But in Kate's story, she felt an, the urge, you felt the urgency of the situation. She needed this medication. You felt anger at the injustice. This wasn't right but you also felt the hope that she had knowing that organizing, bringing people together with a common goal could make a difference. That was her story of self. So through narrative, we are moving people by making hopeful, intentional choices. So that brings us to public narrative. The story of us, of self, us and now. Self, why me? Why should I be involved in this? The story of us, what, what is our shared experience that makes us want to get involved with this? What is it that we need to change and how can we work together to do that? And finally, the now. What is the nightmare that we face and how can we overcome it? What is that hope that we have of seeing a better day? The choice that we can make um, to make it real. All right, now it's your turn. Now it's your turn for prophetic hope, as Marshall called it. We're going to let you turn to your neighbor and take a moment to talk to answer a couple of questions. One. 
what called you to leadership and health? And imagine what achieving the triple aim looks like in your community. So what I'd like you to do is to get comfortable, relax a minute. We're gonna do some creative visualization for a moment, and then we're gonna to turn to your partner and share. Everybody comfortable? All right, take a deep breath in. Breathe in hope. Exhale stress. Breathe in achievement. Exhale silos. Breathe in peace. Exhale discord. Okay, turn to your partner. We're gonna give you 10 minutes to answer these questions. Imagine what um, what you, how you were called to leadership and health and the AAA.